Okay, looks like everybody's here. So thanks a lot for joining us today for another 2020 innovation webinar. In case this is your first webinar, uh, we at Q Markets host these on a monthly basis. We try to tackle any area relating to corporate innovation, whether that's uh, continuous improvement, open innovation, scouting, creativity, or uh, creative diversity when uh, creating teams, which is the topic of today's session. Uh, we're lucky enough to be joined by our partners at Hidden Innovators, who have some, uh, some great insights. So let's dive right in. First up, these are the speakers for today. So my name is Elliot Wilkins. I, I'm the marketing manager for Q Markets based here out of the UK. I'll be moderating today's session, so it's my job to make sure nothing goes wrong, if possible. Uh, we're also joined by Steve Reed from Q Markets, our VP of US Innovation. Uh, Steve uh, will be sharing a few words about Q Markets and talking about our, uh, our team building capabilities. And our main speaker for today is Lindsay Sutton from Hidden Innovators, the CEO and co founder. So here is the agenda. Um, we'll start off with a quick poll just to understand a bit more about, about you guys and, and exactly how you're building uh, teams currently. Then uh, Steve, like I said, will share a few words about the, ca the capabilities of the Q Markets platform when it comes to building teams. Then we'll have the main bulk of the session, which will be led by Lindsay. Uh, she'll also be joined by Mark from Hidden Innovators, who will be, uh, be sharing some more technical details about, about their exciting tool. And at the end, we'll have a, another quick poll just to make sure you're still paying attention before we dive into the, uh, the questions and answers. So if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask those in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You can also share them in the chat if you prefer, whatever's easiest. Uh, we want this to be an interactive session and to, to make sure that you guys are getting all the information you need. So please don't be shy and, and ask as many questions as you like. Cool, so first up we have a poll. So you should shortly see on your screen a pop-up uh, which will allow you to, to tell us uh, how do you currently identify and create innovation focused teams. So uh, there's a few options here. We have uh, using the, the Q Markets platform, the capabilities that we offer at Q Markets. We have using a different tool or platform and we have using a combination of the above. So a uh, pretty simple question. Um, if you guys could share your, your uh, yeah, share your answers. We'll give you five seconds or so. Looks like most of you have actually already shared, so pretty quick off the mark. Cool. So disappointingly, um, we can see that none of you actually are using the Q Markets platform currently to uh, to identify and create innovation-focused teams. So that's a shame. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, what Steve shows you can uh, can change that. Uh, however, we, it's, it's good to see that at least 88% uh, of you are using a tool, a dedicated tool or platform to create your teams. Uh, we don't have the option for you to share the, any uh, details within the poll functionality, but if you could leave a, a question in the Q&A section or in the, in the chat section explaining what platform you use currently or giving us a bit of information about the tool or platform that you use, that would be really interesting for us uh, to, make, to either discuss in the Q&A or just for us to, to research and learn, learn a bit more about how you guys are doing that currently. So please, uh, yeah, feel free to, to do that. Okay, so I think that's it for me for now. I'll hand over to Steve. Thanks, Elliot, and let me... Uh... Share my screen real quickly. Elliot, you're just going to need to help me here. Are you seeing the um, PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, great. All right. So actually, those these polls are, are, are getting better each month. So one of the things that'll that'll come out of this, hopefully, from a customer perspective, is. Uh, key markets tool. One thing we're really good at is listening to our customers. So you see a list of, of some pretty well-known companies. And of course, there's, there's hundreds of others that we work with. But one of the things we pride ourselves on 
is uh, listening to our clients and implementing change based on, on their current needs. And so just as a reminder of who we are, I know we've been doing this now for years, but um, we're a, a innovation ecosystem, <clears throat> literally from end to end, starting with trends all the way to finished products where um, as a customer, you're able to evaluate what's coming in the future, um, bring in partners, experts, academia, startups, uh, reach out to your employees, um, search for technology and, and uh, acquisitions through our scouting tool, all the way through our project management component, which gets you ready for launch and, and really building out uh, improvements and uh, new processes, new products and new customer centric focused ideas. So um, again, just a, just a reminder of, of, of that. Um, we're actually going to jump into the system a little bit today for about 30 seconds. So um, again, focusing on that idea of listening to our clients, when you scale innovation, meaning you, you implement a solution like our, our product here, and this is our, you know, our flagship solution, our QID8 product, you can see as you log in, I'm looking at the hive, which really tells me what's happening uh, for me personally, whether it's a campaign, um, things that uh, maybe a, a, a shark tank, which has been run and it's congratulating a, an employee who, who implemented an idea that's been, in, uh, that's been now in use uh, and we're sharing ROI on that. Um, one of the key components, of course, is as I engage and I, I'm involved in either a campaign or an open idea submission, um, I can, of course, submit my ideas. And that's, that's really where it all starts with the crowd. But another key component is... Uh, as you start scaling ideas, right, as you go from 50 or 100 ideas to 500 or 1,000 or more ideas, um, how do you scale building out these ideas, right? You're, you're straining resources. And so uh, our product has this really well thought out design, which, and again, you can see this is someone else's idea. I'm welcome to comment. I'm welcome to give feedback. But there's two real ways where the system uh, is building organic teams, right? The first is I have the ability when I see an idea to do what we call join the team, right? Which is, hey, this is a great idea. I have a skill set, whether I'm in finance or HR or engineering or r and I've got something I could contribute to this idea. And as I, I would then type in my, um, my case and, and share that, um, I then hit join the team. And this allows then uh, whoever will take over ownership but the, to really look and say, okay, we've got this great idea. It's moving along, uh, but we need resources. And so it's this, again, this organic team that can be put together. A uh, second way is the AI built into the system. Uh, and the AI in the system is telling us a story. It's saying, hey, based on this topic, based on the keywords and phrases of this particular idea, we have built-in people, whether it's someone to be a subject matter expert, someone to be on a team uh, as we put together a prototype or a proof of concept. So the system's gonna make recommendations based on who you are, uh, where you sit in the organization, uh, your department, your experience, skill sets that you have. And so I, I have two great ways. And, and of course, the third is I can predetermine it. So let me add a third, which is, I can assign based on the type of idea in advance, hey, these would be people who would fit that particular idea. Um, all great ways to build teams um, and, and all support what our, our global clients are doing. But one thing that um, we're seeing more and more is as you put together these teams, uh, it's one thing to have a skill set. It's one thing to have an interest or a desire to be involved in a project. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have success with, with that pr prototype or with that team concept of, of building something. And so I'm excited to have Hidden, Hidden Innovators here. They're a partner I've been working with for a little, little while. I'll even confess we, uh, as a team, as a sales organization, uh, took their assessment. It was really uh, interesting what we learned. But um, one of the things you're going to hear today is best practices that they share is um, Perfect teams are, are really scientific based. And, and so I, uh, with that, Lindsay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, look forward to what you have to share with everyone today. Thank you so much. I just wanna say thank you to Q Markets for inviting us to do this. And uh, I am absolutely a believer that time is your most valuable asset. Um, so thank you to all the participants that are on that are tuning in, because um, that is, absolutely critical. 
Um, let me figure out how to share my screen. And then you tell me if you can see it. Good. Is everybody? You're good. Yep. See? Okay, what you'll see today. So we're going to talk a little bit about creative diversity and why that is the topic and why it's so important for us. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my research and how there is actually three creative personas. When we think about problem solving, especially when we're thinking about innovation, um, we typically tend to take three, one of three tracks. And then we're going to talk about why getting all of them together to collaborate in a comprehensive, productive way is super important. Talk a little bit about team development. And then I am going to turn it over to Mark. Uh, my colleague, and he's going to show you a little bit about how we can get intentional about team formation. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about creative diversity, um, a little bit different. It's a deep level diversity metric. Um, so we're going to talk, let's talk about the myths that we have right now. This is typically what we see in our organizations right now. Some people are creative. Only a few people are creative. Not everyone is creative. Right, so we have to cognitively, consciously dispel the myth that not everyone is creative. We are all creative. We think artists are creative, musicians are creative, writers are creative, but what about engineers? What about accountants, plumbers, science teachers? They're all creative, right? So what we see in organizations is that, okay, now we've identified that only a few people are creative, let's keep them all together. You see this in innovation groups, right? Sometimes it's IT that's charged with kind of really developing ideas and moving the business forward. And then out of that innovation group or out of that siloed creative group, only some ideas then are creative. These are the two myths that we really care. It's a, it's a cognition we carry when we're engaging with people, when we're thinking or looking out across the organization today. Well, we got to dispel them. We have to break the way we see people, the way we treat people, that they are truly creative and everybody is creative and can create ideas. Because there is kind of two, two things happening. There's revolutionary ideas and there's evolutionary ideas, right? There's small increments forward that really change the game. And then there's these large leaps. And sometimes we think it's only those large leaps that are innovative. So these are the two myths I want you to think about and, and think about how they're currently showing up and how you do business and how you think about innovation and how you currently problem solve. And to do that, let's level set on the definition, right? Let's talk about what it is to be creative. These are people that are regularly solving problems. We are solving problems every day. Think about that. In every function of our lives, whether we're parents, whether we're taking care of aging, aging parents, um, how we're, if you're a homeowner, you are solving problems every day. And then where they become innovative, right, is if they're novel, they're initially novel, and they become accepted by culture. So this is this place of creativity. We are all creative. That is, if there's one thing I want you to take, it is that you are creative. Everyone around you is creative. Right? So this is my first thing that dispels the myth. But, there is a but, we are all creatively different. So if we're all creative, we need to start asking how then are we creatively different? How are we creative if we know we're all creative, right? We have different flavors of creativity. Research tells us a lot of this was done um, by Michael Curtin. He's a British psychologist. Um, and he's basically saying, hey, we have different creative levels. We have different creative styles. This really shows up in our brains and our biology. So think about that. Uh, our skill set. We as organizational leaders have hired the brightest, the most skilled, the most experienced, the smartest, the most intelligent, the most adaptable, whatever it is, we've hired for skills, experience, and expertise, right? That creative, but then we're, we're almost locking up some of their creativity, right? So we have brains, biology, behaviors is really that motive. Like what motivates us to be creative? And then what are the opportunities or boundaries or constraints or environments we find ourselves in, in order to express our creativity? One of the things that I found when I realized creativity is locked up in people is ask them about their hobbies. Ask them about they do, what they do when they're not working. And you will see this very creative expression in some people. So people are expressing creativity and there's an opportunity for us to make sure that it's included in this innovation process, right? So we know that we're all creatively different. Let's change the way we think about it. We are creative, we're creatively different. And now there's no ideal or superior combination of creative level or style or opportunity or motive. 
There's not one that's better than the other. We need all of them. And that is this concept of creative diversity, right? Radical ideas, whether they're revolutionary or evolutionary, can come from any single person. And we have to figure out a way to engage them, meet them where they're at, let them be creatively different, and let us provide a space to explore and leverage that difference. So I love this. Um, I love talking about this because we do need bold creativity. We live in a very interesting time right now. And in order, if we're not seeking to disrupt, we will be disrupted. The world is moving so fast right now. We need imagination. We need flexibility. We need these things. Um, there was a study done, and I just want to say this, and, and if you don't think creativity is locked up, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about this research. Uh, a re a, a studying NASA, creativity in NASA, you know, astronauts and, and, and the engineers there, um, found that nearly testing 300,000 adults, only 2% of them could pass this creative creativity test. Only 2%. They did the same test in kids under five, 98% passed. This was about creativity. So what this researcher decided was that non-creative behavior is learned. It's like we have this potential and it gets locked up and locked down as we learn processes and procedures and organizational charts and all these that kind of constrain and constrict our thinking. So when we, uh, Adobe did a really good study too, that 83% of people feel that unlocking creativity is key to economic growth. So think about that, right? And then staggeringly, those same people, four out of five, don't feel like they're living up to their creative potential. Meaning you have untapped creative potential in your ranks across your organization. It is about finding it, exercising it, and allowing people to authentically show up in creative ways. That is where innovation and true problem solving and what we would refer to as meaningful innovation happens. So in my research, um, you know, with the hidden, with hidden innovators, this is really what we found. We spent years studying how people show up to problem solve in these organizations. So we have dreamers. Dreamers are our imagined first people. They are future oriented. They're really about desirability. These are, they, they love that idea space of what the world could look like. If we could solve this problem, what could the world look like? Right? And then there's sages. Sages are learned first. I am a very deep sage. I want to learn as much as I can. Um, I am absolutely about a historical record. What do we already know that could help us solve this problem? What do we need to know in order to make good decisions, right? These are your knowledge workers. And then tinkerers are the create first kind. They're the doers, right? They are looking at the resources around them and saying, look, we can prototype this rapidly and make decisions from there. So you have these, these types of people in your organization that are in different departments but they typically fall in one of these three ways. They will approach problem solving. The goal then becomes getting them to work together, allowing this diversity to complement each other rather than conflict with each other, right? Because research also tells us that sometimes diversity gives us friction points. But if we can manage that, if we can bring them together, that's when we can creatively and effectively move the innovation process forward. We can leverage all of the innovation and all of the creative potential in our ranks. What, this is what we call the science of social creativity. When you have all these individuals, how do you get them working together effectively? That's social creativity. We know what happens and we know the cost when teams don't work together. We have so much industry research on that, right? You've got such a low success rate on some of your projects that come at a very high cost to organizations. These are very costly projects, especially when they fail, especially when they're out of budget, off time, um, they've taken up more resources than we originally anticipated. And we know that some of these projects are the ones that will make and break a whole business. They are the reason some businesses will not last. So here's the deal, right? Um, we are, I'm a huge kind of sports person. I love sports analogies. 
Um, and this is one of the things I, I'm a team player through and through. Um, I've always loved being on teams and you know, you've hired the right people. You've hired smart, you've hired skilled. It is getting them to work together. That is the toughest challenge we have. So considering this deep level diversity, this creative diversity is a way to get them to move from conflict to compliments, right? So this is the team development. Um, this is what we know again from research uh, that we're going to move through these phases of team development, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Um, what's really interesting though, is when you're putting these diverse teams together, these cross-functional teams, we know a majority of them are dysfunctional. They never really get out of this valley of death. This is where teams fail. We need diversity for innovation, right? And creative problem solving, but diversity is probably one of the reasons they'd never get out of the valley of death, right? They never get out of storming. But there is an opportunity for us to move from that divergent thinking, flatten that curve to get to convergence so you're actually moving forward on ideation, moving forward on implementation, and the team is still intact. The team is still intact, right? So how do I know what persona I am? You know, how do I know, how did I know that I was a sage? Well, I developed an assessment, right? We test people and we just say it's, it's a super easy 10 minute, answer a few questions, and then you're gonna know what your preference for problem solving is. So it's saying when I can keep you in your zone of genius, when my team is like, hey, let's put Lindsay on research, I'm, I'm super happy. I love synthesizing information and, and finding patterns and, and looking for the bits of value. They don't need all that. I just want to bring value to the team. And this is my strength in doing that. So this is some of the content that you get. Um, the other two metrics in the assessment are cognitive flexibility. This is your ability to be open-minded and move from idea to idea without necessarily owning it as your own, right? And then team player index is really your desire and propensity to want to either collaborate and how you collaborate in teams or your need to work individually. Both are very valuable, right? We need people who can work independently and then also come back to the team and collaborate effectively. Right, so knowing that my team is tinkers, my team is dreamers, I'm the deep sage, they know how to talk to me and get some of my best work and I know how to do the same. So the first step for hidden innovators is an assessment, just figuring out what you are. And then it's turning it into how do we start getting you to work together, right? How do we get to this place of convergent diversity? No longer divergent, no longer sitting in that valley of storming and never getting out, never moving forward right? Convergent and, and tweaking those levers now that you know where people are, how they approach problem solving, how you can best leverage that on your teams and be intentional about its formation. Because there is, there is some issues when the team looks all the same or there, when it lacks diversity in this space, right? So when it looks like all tinkers or looks like all dreamers, and what I'm going to do is turn it over to Mark to talk more about that, um, and give you a little bit of a story about how, how our product and how this solution has come to life with Hidden Innovators. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate it. So I want to start my portion of the presentation by talking about uh, a project that we once did. We were brought in by a global manufacturing company, and they brought us in because they had a challenge that they were trying to fix. It had been over a year and this problem has still gone unresolved. And so we met with a team of individuals that the client had assembled uh, to seek a solution. And during the meeting, it became very quickly apparent that everyone in the meeting that the client had assembled was either an engineer or they had a technical background. And so that's not super surprising given that they're a manufacturer. Um, engineers and technicians, they like to build things as Lindsay indicated, they like to create, that's their natural disposition. In our world, we call that persona a tinkerer. And so what that looks like, if you have a team of just tinkerers, on the next slide, you'll see that they're represented by this group of, of green individuals. This is what the team looked like that we were meeting with. And, and that, was, that was predictable given the manufacturing, but also we see that when we go into other organizations. For instance, if we were going into a university, which we do often, uh, we might walk into the room and it's not surprising to see that the group is made up predominantly of sages. Sages, they like to learn first, right? 
um, and that makes sense given their context. But um, learning first is a super valuable skill. Uh, absolutely, you need someone who's going to be able to to look to the past and see all of the research and things that have been done and bring that historical perspective to the present. That's really valuable. Uh, Tinkerer is very valuable too. Who's going to actually create what it is that you're ideating on? But tinkerers are also super valuable in the discovery process. They lend a, a, a whole lot of information to that process as well. These two things I'm showing you right now, those are called team cohesion maps. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So back to this team. So we're meeting with them. It's one of those rooms where there's whiteboards all over the room and, and people are getting up and, they're, and they've got all their diagrams and their, their proposed solutions and they're doing naturally what comes to them. They are trying to build their way to a solution, right? And that's fine because they are looking for feasibility. So we have this meeting and they say, they point to any one of those boards and they go, these are all feasible solutions to the problem. And for them, the meeting is over. That, that's all that was required. Now, from a consultant perspective, we were like, no, that's not, we're missing some components. For instance, um, it may be feasible, it may be possible to build that solution, but is it viable? Is it, is it a viable solution? Sage is naturally geared toward viability. So viability could be from a time perspective. It could be from a, from a financial perspective. It could be from a historical research perspective. What else has been done that's similar to the, to the proposal that you're making? They bring all of that to the table. We're also missing the idea of desirability, which dreamers naturally bring to a team meeting. The, uh, dreamers think outside of just feasibility. You know, the, the engineers are saying what's possible today. Dreamers oftentimes will say what, what's actually possible beyond what's available today. Apple is great at that. So it's super important to have dreamers included in that process. And so at the end of that meeting, we said to the CTO who had brought us in, hey, do you mind if we come back and, 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 and do this with a different group? And she said, sure. And so we went out to the organization, all across the organization and the plant, we curated this group of individuals. And in six weeks, we had a solution to that problem that had been unsolved for over a year. And more importantly, during that process, we uncovered this much, much larger problem that they had that they were able to get a head start on. And by solving that problem, saved them millions and millions of dollars. And they were super happy. So we stepped back and we said, what was the difference between the first team and the second team? And it was because we had more input on the diversity of the group as it was created and we said to ourselves, how can we do that consistently and how can we make that available to others? And that's how Hidden Innovators came to be. So what you're seeing here is this is actually after you log in to our uh, admin portal and we're in a couple of steps already and we're gonna develop a team. So over here to the right, you see the ability to filter. So you may have a hundred or several hundred people that have taken the assessments required in order to have the the, the ability to filter. It's everyone who's taken the assessment. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to decide, do I want dreamer, tinkerers, and sages? And the majority of our clients actually click all three for reasons we've discussed previously. Secondly, that you might want to draw from a particular department. And so that functionality allows you to do that. Um, and for instance, if the thing that you're trying to solve is has a particular illegal element to it, maybe it's going to end up in a patent and that's your goal. You, you still want all three personas, but you also probably want someone who's there from the legal department. And so you have a different mix like that you're able to choose. Thirdly, you can bring people in from outside. As long as they've taken the assessment, these could be other units in your organization. They could be businesses outside. They could be partners. They could be consultants. They could be vendors. And you can bring those people in and they add a wonderful dimension as well. So as you can see, that's kind of like the crowdsourcing for ideas, but this is crowdsourcing for the actual solution teams that you put together. So next, I'm going to move you to the bench. The bench is just the people that you have available to make teams out of. And as you can see, the persona is there, describes them with their name and also the scores that they have. You're going to move on to the next step. You're going to name this team. And then you have two options. You can create team where you'll continue the process and you'll do it manually in terms of putting it together. Or you could, you could choose to do the team generation, which uses one of our algorithms to dynamically optimize the mix of people that you put into a team, which is a pretty exciting feature. Now, on the next page, I'm going to jump to where you actually have your team assembled. And so that's what you have over here to the left that you see. It has your team members. And again, it has its scores. And you can see who they are. In the middle then, we see this new cohesion map. And you can see right off, there's quite a bit of a difference between this cohesion map in terms of, in terms of the blend of those three personas and what I previously showed you 
which is now featured up in the right hand corner. And so this is not only blended well and diverse within the fact that they have the three personas well represented, but it's also the, the width of those bands, the connections you see between those individuals are actually the connections um, that those people are gonna have in terms of the conflicts that, that might arise or the cohesion, the cooperation that they're gonna show. And so the, a big part of this, not as just the mix, but also the ability in advance of putting that team together and meeting with them, being able to know who in the individual team is going to be able to contribute and who, who in, in, in a pairing of those individuals, you might want to get ahead of that in that storming phase. We actually coach our clients and be able to do that, um, and it makes for a much more successful team. In final, I just want to show you this last feature, which is even when you have the team together, the one I just showed you is based on relationships. You could also choose the one below that, which is creative. And what it does is it keeps the same team, but it changes the width and the, and the connections between individuals because it's based on cognitive flexibility. That's what it's focusing on. Its algorithm says, in terms of cognitive flexibility, how will these people relate to each other? And each of those different ones that you can click on are gonna tell you different things about the team and for the whole purpose of creating more dynamic communication and more productive communications. Now, there's a lot of steps in here that I didn't show you, but in order to do that, we are gonna to move to the next step, which is we would love to offer you for everybody that's on the presentation, you can get a free uh, Hidden Innovators for Teams account. We're gonna give you access to the portal. You'll be able to assign assessments. You'll be able to create teams. You'll be able to set goals. We're gonna give you 10 free assessments, which you can take one yourself and use the rest for your team members and up to an hour's worth of more in-depth, just focus on your team for your people that took it We'll show you how to put them together into team and use all the other functionality we weren't able to show you today. And to do that, all you got to do is uh, click on or copy down one of these links or just hold your phone up to the QR code. It'll take you directly to the registration page. You have to register first. And then when you get into the portal, you'll see an area where it'll ask you for a promo code. That promo code is the QM webinar. You do that and you're good to go. I think now it's probably time for the Q&A portion. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Mark. And thank you, Lindsay. That was, I think uh, I can speak for everyone when I say that that was really inspiring uh, and educational and fascinating, uh, especially seeing exactly how your uh, your tool, uh, tool works. Uh, so yeah, first of all, we do have a second poll to conduct. So let me quickly launch this for you all. Okay, so you should be seeing it now on your screen. Uh, the question in this poll is, how important do you think diversity is when creating teams? And uh, the answers there are pretty standard, extremely important, very important, somewhat important, or not important at all. So if you could quickly provide your answers there, and we'll share the results shortly. So I'll give you five or 10 seconds to, to, uh, to share. What's interesting with this question is that we that the phrasing is uh, relating to the diversity and not necessarily creative diversity. So it could be relating to uh, the background of, of your uh, users and teams as well. So it's uh, it, it's slightly different when we're thinking about creative creative diversity to diversity in general and and how they are both relevant when it comes to innovation. Okay, so let me share these results with you. Uh, interestingly, there is a bit of a split. We have, um, as expected, most of you, after uh, this, this great presentation, presentation, you can see how uh, creative diversity is extremely important. But it's interesting to see that uh, it's not unanimous. Uh, some people do believe that it's not uh, that it's only somewhat important. So, um, any thoughts on these results, guys? Uh, you should be able to see them now. Yeah, I think there's um, when we talk about diversity, it means a lot of things, right? So we have um, a lot of DNI movement and and uh, progress being made here, um, especially when it comes to race, gender, um, and I think there's an opportunity for us to look at deep level diversity as well, which is really important. Like, what, how can I leverage the way you approach the world, that experience, that skill set, um, how you problem solve to really help organizations solve some of their toughest challenges. How do you let people show up as they are and use those strengths to really, really shine? 
Right. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, so unless there's anything else, I'll uh, jump into the questions. I can see that we already have a few. Uh, so first up, we have, how can we integrate the Hidden Innovators tool slash methodology into the Q Markets platform? So hopefully we can have a good answer for that. And let me just from a technical standpoint say, um, just, just to be clear, they are two separate, right? So you saw the platform and obviously they have a, a pretty robust assessment tool uh, as well as a, a, a team building tool. So um, that would be more of an offline discussion um, and, and we, could, we could jump into that. So what we'd like to do is maybe uh, schedule a follow-up call and, and go over that. So probably the easiest way to do it. So. Perfect. I think from, and I would just say, I think from our perspective, when Steve showed you the manual process, uh, you can use our tool, you can use the assessments and you can develop those teams and then you can just transfer that knowledge into Q markets because you've got a manual uh, choice that Steve showed us earlier. So really it's, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, you, you have more confidence in the people that you put in there manually and it just complements what's already there. Right. Yeah, I know that it's very easy for us to integrate and to import data into our uh, into our system with uh, the individual profiles. So having a profile field that shows just at least the persona associated with the uh, individual that's been identified on your identified on your uh, platform can be really useful in and of itself. So uh, plenty of options there. Uh, second question is, at what stage of the innovation process can or should we utilize uh, the uh, Hidden, Hidden Innovators tool? Yeah, um, I, I can speak a little bit to this one. So we are, when we allow individuals to be who they are, like I've been saying, um, their, their potential and their impacts on the innovation process is from start to finish. Um, and I would say when you have you know, typically we see the process in two phases. We have this kind of ideation where we can crowdsource ideas across our organizations. And then we have this implementation phase and we see diversity, um, particularly creative diversity kind of shrinks a bit in the implementation phase. But let's talk a bit about even the crowdsourcing of ideas. Because when you're thinking about participation in an innovation campaign or in a problem solving campaign or a challenge, you wanna make sure you're getting as much participation and engagement as you can. What I will tell you is sages and, tr and tinkerers and dreamers will all respond to prompts differently. So there is a way to customize and tailor information or even tailor um, some of the challenges, not just the messaging around it, not just the communication around it, to make sure you're getting your sages and your tinkerers and your dreamers to even volunteer those ideas. So the first step would be looking at your participation rates. Are, is your whole organization engaged? What are ways to get them more engaged in that ideation phase? Then we can talk about diversity moving forward in the implementation phase. Yes, we know that diverse viewpoints naturally have friction and tension. There are ways to manage it when you know how people show up to problem solve. When you know that sages have severe imposter syndrome and they're really, really concerned about getting it right. When you know tinkers just want to do, and the, as a sage who's collecting research, I'm slowing their process down. There's a natural friction point. I can manage against that as a team lead and a team builder. I can prepare for that. I can anticipate that, right? When I just know how they approach problem solving. And, and just to add to that, um, just from a best practice standpoint, um, what we traditionally see is ideation is scaled. It goes to a large audience. And the goal, of course, is the crowd is going to produce dozens, hundreds of ideas. And then as you start going through the these look promising pro, um, process, this is where generally the team concept will jump in, right? So in terms of actually when these teams need to be engaged, it's not going to be right up front. It'll be because the topics are going to be different, different, right? If I'm asking a question around uh, how do we become more customer centric, or if I'm asking around how do we go back to work in the times of COVID, these are different questions that require different teams. So to throw together people out of the box really is, is not a best practice. We'd recommend it would be as the ideas come in, that's where teams are created. So, Great. Um, one more question here. Uh, how can organizations overcome col corporate cultural barriers that hinder building diverse innovation teams? This is a really good question and I'm kind of glad it was asked because um, it's, it is something that we see 
in organizations. So it's really interesting because when Mark was showing you the full green um, cohesion map or the full red, organizations have a culture and have a persona type that they, that they actually start hiring for, that they start becoming, right? So like we were talking about in academia, I know that I'm surrounded by a ton of sages, right? So that it actually promotes that singular persona. It has to start at the team level, right? So if I'm a team builder, I find a tool like this and I say, look, I really want to be intentional about diversity. It is about channeling and asking the right um, and making sure that the permissions are there to say, look, I only have tinkers on my team. I really need dreamers and stages. We're actually watching this tool be used um, in a very large life insurance company um, who is in the process of reconfiguring and putting new teams together. They're using this tool to say, hey, I have all tinkers on my team. I, if I am considering new hires, I want to make sure that I have a dreamer tanker or sage tankers or even just sages to help augment what I know, the problems and issues, and even the progress and success I see with my tinkers, right? So it's using this tool to be intentional, not only about hiring, but then also being intentional about how you get other people and how you augment those personas throughout the organization. You can use what you have to get what you need. That's why Hidden Innovators was, was built. There is creative potential locked up in the ranks today. And that's, I think that's an important point to make. We showed you sages and dreamers and tinkers. Actually, um, there's a good number of people that are dreamer sages or, or tinkerer dreamers. Um, so th basically what that means is numerically they're, they're balanced between those two. And so it's not just a single thing oftentimes. Sometimes people are, I'm a hardcore dreamer. Lindsay's a hardcore sage. Um, many people are just a thing, but a, a good number of people are, are double and they can play both roles and they're very valuable because they see both perspectives. I mean, and th that's, you know, let me not to belabor the point, but this does not presuppose that you are only one of these things and you will only ever be one of these things ever in your whole life. You're born it, you're going to die it. No, it's to say we actually have a combination as high performing intelligent people, we can probably do and perform in all of these roles. We can perform as tinkers. We can perform as dreamers. I can certainly perform as sage. It is my preference when I am approached with a new problem to act like a sage. If I have all sages around me and I need to move the project forward, I will probably look and act more like a tinker. Right? So it is just considering how that mashup and mix up happens and then giving each other the nouns and verbs, the environment that promotes that collaboration and effective collaboration. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. That was a great answer. So uh, finally, I think we could just quickly address the uh, responses that we received uh, to the first polls. So uh, a couple of you responded telling us the, the tools that you actually use to create and identify innovation teams currently. And the two answers that we received there were Storms and uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, so I, I don't know a huge amount about those platforms, but um, Steve, uh, Lindsay, Mark, do you have any comments about how um, that can be addressed? Oh, wow. <laughs> Steve, you had a slides ready to. <laughs> uh, Steve, you're on a mute, I think. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I, th this one's a big one, and I could see when I, when I saw it that I, I dropped into it an actual video. So, um, the, the, look, we're a software company, right? And we work with dozens and dozens of uh, different platforms for integrations. And so Microsoft Teams is probably, not probably, it's the biggest trending uh, service that we, we work with. So I would just tell you, we have different ways of doing it, but the key is people are already commenting and, and creating ideas in Microsoft Teams. Our software allows you to uh, take that and move it into the platform very naturally. Um, and, and so our, our, our mantra is meet your employees where they are today. Uh, there, there's a natural barrier of resistance that comes up uh, when you say, hey, we've got a new software. So if they're communicating in SharePoint, which was also the, another one mentioned, if they're communicating in MS Teams, if they're communicating in Slack and on and on, uh, the system is built to allow you to, when we set it up, create an integration point so that they're still there and then they're brought into the system naturally. So I just wanted to highlight that and I, I know we're over, so. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly 
I just wanted to quickly say that we also and our clients use this to analyze existing teams. It doesn't have to be a new team from a dead start. Many, many, many people use this to actually analyze the existing team. So you might bring a team in from Microsoft Teams, but you can also use hidden innovators to say, well, what is the makeup of that team? Um, and it's very insightful to be able to do that and see if you need to add a mix or get more diverse. Makes sense. Okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, we have uh, ran over slightly. So thank you if you stuck with us until the end. Uh, and thank you so much to, to Mark and Lindsay and Hidden, Hidden Innovators for uh, joining us. I really appreciate these, uh, these great insights and I'm sure our uh, audience have done as well. So yeah, if, if any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send them over. Hopefully you'll take advantage of the, uh, the offer to make use of the Hidden Innovators platform. And uh, be sure to join us on our next webinar. Uh, it, sh it should be taking place towards the end of October. So hopefully we'll see you on there. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Thank Enjoy the rest so of your day. Yeah, bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.